Okay, so Donald, John Donnelly from your Holistic Academy, and my guest today is Donald O'Leary. Very welcome, Donald. How are you today? Great, thanks. Thanks, John. Good. Donald, uh, I just uh, want the opportunity to speak to you about your, uh, your sort of uh, passion in life is health and wisdom. Yeah. yeah. So where, where did that passion come from, Donald? How did you, how did you get to that? Uh... Well, I was, I was a curious child. I'm the oldest of 10. I grew up on a small farm in Kerry and being the oldest, I spent a bit of time on my own as a child. And I remember days down by the river on my own and throwing pebbles in the river and watching the shadow of the clouds creeping over the landscape and listening to the corn creek at dusk. So that's kind of whetted my imagination. So that was a, a happy childhood, all yeah. Uh, it was. It was rural. Uh, it was rural, isolated, austere in a way. In some ways, I grew up more in the atmosphere and the environment of my grandparents. We 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 lived in a small in a small house at the end of a boreen in the middle of nowhere. When we went to primary school, we. We walked through the fields. Some of the listeners might know of Alice Taylor. Yeah. She wrote a book by that name. And she came from that part of the world across the border, <laughs> the border, so to speak, in County Cork. Yeah, yeah. And um, we would cross to um, small rivers or streams. We called them gloshes in that part of the world. Alice Taylor does as well. Mm. But if, if they were really flooded, if they were seriously flooded, we, we couldn't go to school at all. Yeah. Uh, but we, that only happened quite infrequently. Yeah. I remember another day walking to school in the month of May or so and uh, being very late, not because I was mitching, but because I was fascinated by the rabbits in the fields on a, on a, on a, on a sunny May morning. Yeah. I got lost. I got lost watching the rabbits, and forgot about school altogether. Yeah, yeah. I haven't heard that word "mitching" for a long, long time, though. But that's that's the word we used to use in the, ourselves when I was going to school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so uh, I mean, your teachers in school then would would they they were very connected to nature as well, were they? Or? They were. We. It was a very small school, a two-room, the two-teacher school. There would have been maybe six or seven in each class, maybe a total of 50 in the school. And that was that was out in the country as well. I mean, there was no house even that close to it. And um, we played a bit of football and handball against the gable wall. Yeah. And I have a lot of interesting memories of those days. Sometimes we'd bring a side of turf to the school to make a fire. And we would put a newspaper across the fireplace to increase the draft, if you picture it this. Yeah. And then the newspaper might go in fire. <laughs> it's but, bringing back memories for me, Donald, the exact same, exact same thing in, in my house when I was growing up. Yeah. But, but one of my other favorite memories is one of my, colleague, one of my school colleagues being up, in, uh, up high in his, he was in a big um, cupboard press high up and uh, he couldn't be seen there. And um, the priest came and this guy, I won't mention his name. He was peeping out of the press high up behind the priest. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and one of my teachers had a brother, a priest, and he, he would come and tell us about the foreign missions. Yeah. And he, I remember getting a question from the, the priest, the teacher's brother, asking, he said to us like something like, uh, if, a, if, a, if a building at a church, if a church is 10, meet, 10, feet, uh, 10 feet by four feet, and you want to put a, a bit of string all around it, how long is the piece of string? And of course it had to be a church. There was a lot about religion and go teach on nations and, uh, the wonders of priesthood and um, 
going to the foreign missions to save the souls in Africa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a different time, Donald, and, and I mean, that time the priest, of course, was uh, was revered, if you like, in, 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 uh, at that time. And uh, yeah. I remember, certainly from in my own uh, memory of childhood, it was, uh, the priest was like, Place was like God almost. Uh, he was he was revered and feared in equal measure. Yeah, 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 and that's the bit that uh, that's the bit I guess that uh, I mean, why wh wh where does that fear come from? Uh, that that's I feel that's the wrong message that uh, <laughs> we're, we're been we've been taught as kids. Uh, we've been taught fear from a from an early age. Yeah. Yeah, I remember being in a church when I was quite young and I was away at the back of the church and it was Palm Sunday. And this elderly man who was beside me at the, towards the back of the church, uh, the priest uh, shaked the holy water using the palm around and he never came back towards us. And this elderly man said to me in, the, in that unique way they say it down there, no, no word about us. Now, you'd have to be down there. You'd have to be from there almost to get that. Yeah. He, all he said was, no word about us, but he said so much. There yeah. was so much. There was, he said so much in those few words. But you'd nearly need to be from there to get the nuances of that expression. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very, uh, very uh, sort of uh, idyllic, sort of in, in many ways, an idyllic sort of childhood. Uh, but also a, a great freedom, obviously, in, 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 and no sort of uh, no real technology or anything that, that sort of uh, noise disruptions of, uh, back in those days, Donald. Oh, it was it was idyllic in in many ways. It yeah. was harsh and austere and frugal as well. Yeah, yeah. And and um, my parents, I grew up on the farm that my father grew up on, and my mother came from an adjoining small farm. Yeah. You could see one house from the other. Yeah. And sometimes I say that if both your parents come from adjoining small farms, you can't get much more rooted than that. Yeah. Yeah. But as I sometimes say in my own way, you know, the ground, the ground that gives the tree nourishment uh, prevents it from moving. So there are pluses and minuses. Yeah, And I remember um, my father might be back at my uncle's house and my mother would have the dinner ready. And the question is, how did my mother let my father know that the dinner was ready? Now, this would have been a cup about two miles distance. Yeah, yeah. How did, how did my mother let my father know that the dinner was ready? No, it wasn't smoke. <sighs> Uh, it was, she put a white sheet, a big white sheet on a bush yeah. in the direction of her old home. My yeah. father would see it and yeah. he would be over in a couple of minutes on the push bicycle. <laughs> what a fantastic story. What a simple, simple, simple sort of lifestyle that, that uh, and, and, uh, and yet uh, so much freedom, freedom in that, uh, I feel, Donald, in, in that type of lifestyle that people lived yeah. back then. The other thing that was unique about it and was almost unique about it then was we had no mechanization of any kind whatsoever. Yeah. We had no car, we had no milking machine, no tractor, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So mm. absolutely everything was done by hand. Yeah. You save the hay, yeah. milk the cows, cut and save the turf. Absolutely everything was done by hand. Yeah including and, and, including yeah. getting including getting the water from the neighbor's field yeah there was a well in the neighbor's field just at the back of our house and we had access we had access to the well i mean we were in good terms with them anyway yeah. but we had a le we had a legal right to go there for water yeah although we 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 had it anyway yeah so you would have a, a sort of a, that would have uh, given you a deep connection with nature and, and all things natural and organic though. And, and that's what you've sort of brought with you on your journey and your health journey, yeah? Absolutely. I still have a love for the sound of flowing water. Mm. Uh, I spent a lot of times by the river and the, and the streams and the sound of the sound of flowing water over stones 
is still so soothing. Yeah. It's such a soothing sound to me. Yeah, yeah. And you're, you're passionate about sort of, uh, sort of the wisdom of life and how to live a life though, rather than, uh, that's, that's really your passion, isn't it? About how to, live a, how to live life well. I think it's how to be authentic, how to be free. You know, we use the phrase, I be yourself, but we generally use it very glibly and superficially. Uh, for me, being oneself is more than not pretending. It's, 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 a, it's a freedom to be in one's own skin and to be comfortable there. You know, I, you probably heard me before saying that I, can, I break down wisdom into three parts. Uh, that is insight, uh, perception, what you see, and perspective. Yeah. And in more recent years, I place more and more importance on perspective. It's seeing the big picture. It's kind of seeing the part in relation to the whole. Mm. It's not focusing on one part of the jigsaw. It's seeing that part of the jigsaw where it fits into the whole jigsaw. Yeah. Mm. And, and fr free freedom and peace. And when I say freedom, I'm talking about a personal freedom. Mm. Uh, and and there's a peace and a freedom that comes from just being. Uh, the world is very caught up with having, knowing, and doing. Yeah. In fact, I would say that we're very externally focused. Yeah. And we get lost in the, we get lost in the passing parade of life. It's all passing ephemeral and, and it's just passing. And I sometimes make a distinction between the manifest and the unmanifest. What I mean by the manifest is the manifest world, yeah. the phenomenal world, yeah. the ever-changing world of, of, of happening, our apparent happening. Yeah. And what I call the unmanifest world is what we essentially are. It's more a peace and a silence. It's ever changing, eternal. And, and uh, only there can one find peace and serenity and happiness. Mm. Yeah. We keep looking for what we already are. Yeah. There's a, there's a saying, there, there's a saying, there's a saying that says, you are what you seek. Yeah. So in, in more recent years, I'm, I'm recommending to myself and others, stop searching. Yeah. Stop searching for happiness. You are happiness. And John, I'll put it this way, to look for something, to look for something, you have to believe that you don't have it. Yeah. You know, clearly, if yeah. you, there is, you won't look for something unless you feel you don't have it. Yeah. You yeah. might have heard the story about the guy or the, the person around a, a lamppost and he's looking for something. And someone comes along and says, um, you're looking for something, can I help? And he says, oh, I, I lost my key. Uh, maybe you can help me to find it. And they're searching for a while, and then the guy that's walking by says, are you sure you lost it here? He says, no, I think I lost it down, down in the dark lane. He says, "And but why, why aren't you looking down there? He says, well, there's no light down there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, look for, something, look for something where it is. Yeah. And not because there's a light there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned peace uh, at all. so that's for you that's inner peace that's, that's absolutely mm. yeah yeah and that's the, the that's the ultimate if you like uh, that inner peace and, and uh, uh, sort of health and happiness is uh, obviously uh, I guess those are the things that are the ultimate really for you Tom, yeah it's it's a peace and happiness that is non-dependent and we're all human. 
with it's a peace and happiness that's utterly and non-dependent on anything external. Yeah. Not on position, uh, possessions, not even on relationships. Yeah. It's not dependent on anything at all. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's beyond it's beyond the reach of the world and is on the is unaffected and unaffectable by anything. Mm. Uh, what, the problem is we, we identify with the external ever-changing ephemeral world. Yeah. And when we identify with something, we feel that we are it. And yeah. when we feel that we are it, when we feel that we are it, then we feel that our happiness, our contentment, our value is depending on that. Can, can, I, can I add to that that, you know, we talk a lot about not being enough. I would suggest that that's not the ideal option, not the ideal focus. Yeah. I would, I would say, I would say the issue is not that you feel that you're not enough. The real issue is that you feel you need to be something. Yeah. I would suggest realize, and, and I mean, this is not easy. Yeah. Realize that you don't have to be anything. You, yeah. just, are, you just are, and that's enough. Yeah, yeah. So how, how, do, how, do you, how do you, if you were to ask, if you were, if you were getting someone to connect with that inner peace, though, how would, how would you go about that? I mean, obviously it took you years and years of experience in life to get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was, a, that was a journey you've been on for all your life, Bethany. So Absolutely. I, I would say that I've been reflecting, soul searching, contemplating all my life, even as a child. Yeah. I mean, my, my younger siblings would sometimes say he's, He's quiet, and you wouldn't know what he'd be thinking. Yeah. Re referring, referring, referring to me. Yeah, yeah. So if 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 someone was looking for that peace, because I mean, obviously that's a that's a huge uh, huge quality, if you like, of life that you live now, because you you don't I say you you only depend on yourself. You don't depend on anybody else. So how would you teach somebody that, or is it possible to teach that? It's. It's not possible to teach it. It's possible to see it. Yeah. Words, words at, at their best are only pointers. I mean, if you're driving along the road and, and you see a signpost for where you want to go, the yeah. signpost does not take you there, but it will point you in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. So all words and concepts and parables and analogies are pointers. And the older I get, the more I see the value of moving away from conceptual knowing to experiential knowing. Yeah, yeah. There is, no, there is nothing as valuable as knowing from experience. Yeah, absolutely, Donald. I, I, I agree one hundred percent. So uh, on on that journey, is there is there people that inspired you on that journey, Donald, or is there? A... Well, there there are there are a number. There are a number. One of the people that I'm very I feel lucky to have met is the late John O'Donoghue. Mm. Uh, some. People will know him as the author of Anam Kara, yeah. which for non-Irish people is literally a soul friend. Yeah. Anyway, I was living, I was living in Boston. I spent 14 years in America along the way. Yeah. I was living in Boston in the early 90s. And um, I read in the green paper, the Irish magazine, that some that this mystic philosopher writer was coming to Boston for the summer to give a couple of talks a week. Yeah. I couldn't believe my eyes. This sounded too good to be true. Yeah. yeah. And that was John O'Donoghue who, who grew up on a farm in County Clare. And he came over and he'd give a couple of talks a week. 
And this was pre-Anamkara. Anamkara came out in about 97. He was kind of famous after that. Yeah. But he was, he was relatively unknown at this stage. Yeah. And John, John would arrive, and there might be about 16 or 20 of us in the audience. And John would come with a little a prepared script. And, and eventually, when he saw me in the audience, and I was usually there, he knew that I was good for a comment or a question or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, John brought something to Boston that was sorely lacking. It was this more, more reflective, more poetic way of not just speaking, but of being. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John added a lot to my life in those days. Yeah. Uh, I have described it as, as I've described it on occasion as manna from heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he, he was an extraordinary guy with a great heart and uh, an irrepressible way of life and living. And John would say sometimes that the greatest tragedy was the unlived life. Yeah. And yeah. on one occasion, on one occasion, John read or said something. And my response to him was, there's resonance in authenticity. I had never used that phrase before. I hadn't read it anywhere. I hadn't seen it anywhere. Yeah. And to this day, I wouldn't remember saying it only for John's response. Yeah. And it wasn't so much what he said, but what he didn't say. Yeah. Yeah. He put his head on his hand like this and he said, uh, isn't that a lovely way to say that now? <laughs> and then he went on to say something about indigenous carry wisdom. Yeah. And, and the last time I met John was at John Moriarty's funeral in Killarney. And uh, before the, the coffin arrived at the graveyard, I saw two men standing on the grass, on a piece of, on a grass patch. Yeah. a little distance away and I realized that one of them was John O'Donoghue yeah and I headed I headed in that direction yeah and um, that was John came towards me and gave me a hug the one and only time I ever got a hug from John O'Donoghue never before yeah. and and you know he he as you may know he died short of his 53rd birthday yeah as far as I know, he died in his he died in his sleep, and yeah. that's that's all I know. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, was there other characters then along the way, Don? I mean, health, uh, holistic health, I guess, is your is one of your passions then. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've obviously met uh, and you've studied uh, you've studied you've studied health really, haven't you? Absolutely. Well, I've oh, I've gone to I've gone to New I've gone to downtown New York and Lithuania on my own steam, so to speak. Uh -huh. in my pursuit of health. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one, one man that I learned a lot from was Brian Clement. Yeah. He is a co-director of the Hippocrates Clinic in, in, in Florida. Right. That was a clinic that was started in the 50s uh, by Anne Wigmore from Lithuania, and it subsequently moved to Florida. Yeah, I've heard I've heard uh, Brian Clement lots of times, and I've read his books. Yeah, and what was what was his philosophy of life, uh, John? Or what? Uh, John uh, Brian would advocate uh, food that is organic, unprocessed, uh, uh, un unprocessed, organic, locally grown, in season. And the least cooked, the better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'll repeat that: is it's organic, unprocessed, locally grown, in season, and the least cooked, the better. Brian would advocate moving back to nature. Yeah. One time I did a conference with Brian in in, in the states, and we were allowed to go up to the microphone and make a comment or ask a question. 
And, and my comment was, when I go back home to Ireland, I will tell the people that this was about a return to sanity. Yeah. I mean, what, what I mean by that in part is that I have some time for science and research. But if I had to choose between science slash research and nature, I would take nature any day. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because I, I wouldn't be a fan. I wouldn't be a fan of mercury fillings in your teeth. I would not be a fan of the fluoridation of the public water system. Yeah. In fact, I will I will go so far as to say that I regard the fluoridation of the public water system as mass medication or mass or mass poisoning. Yeah. Depending on your point of view, and I don't like either one. Yeah. 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 So I re I return I return to nature. Uh, good sleep, sunlight, earthing. I'm a big fan of I'm a big fan of earthing, and all I mean by earthing is a physical connection with Mother Earth. Mm. You barefoot on the grass, especially if it's wet. Barefoot at the beach, swimming in the sea is probably the ultimate. Yeah, or, or, or even hugging a tree. Yeah, yeah. Because you you get earthed by hugging a tree. But you don't you don't get earthed if you walk barefoot on a wooden floor in your house. You're not earthed, but if you hug a tree, you are. Yeah. The reason the reason being is that a living tree is a conductor, and dried wood is an insulator. Yeah. Yeah. It's like uh, I mean, it's back to energy. It all. I mean, energy. Everything is energy, and uh, nature. Natural nature, nature's energy is the most powerful. Obviously, I mean, but everything else, uh, manufactured energy is, is not. I mean, doesn't come close, or sure doesn't. The more we're in tune with nature, generally, the healthier we are. Yeah, and and um, we get a great freedom when we stop resisting. Yeah, I'm going to quote Idea Shanti here. Idea Shanti is a kind of a guru in America. Yeah. Adi Ashanti says, enlightenment is nothing more than the complete absence of resistance to what is. Yeah. Enlightenment is nothing more than the complete absence of resistance to what is. I'll, I'll say this. If we, could, if we could wave a magic wand yeah. and drop resistance, our lives would be transformed utterly. Yeah, yeah. We're, const we're almost constantly in resistance and in judgment and wanting things to be different. Yeah. Those of us that are a bit wiser might, might experiment and try to drop the resistance and the judgment and let things be the way they are. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean a passivity here. By all means, do what needs to be done. Yeah. But, but be the instrument rather than the doer. Yeah. And I, I mean, I mean, instrument in the in the Saint Francis of Assisi way. Be the instrument of thy peace is what I think he said. And I'm not being particularly religious religious here at all. Yeah. 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 But there's a lot. There's a lot of there's a lot of wisdom in in religion only that it has been fossilized over the millennia, or at least some of it has. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. If we could, if we could, if we could just see the essence of the parable or the me any message in scripture, like yeah. it says, it says in scripture that it's in dying that you're born to eternal life. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that that's necessarily physically dying at all. Yeah, I think I think it's possibly dying to your rigid opinions, all the things that you've held on to, all the things that you think you are, that's weighing you down from being the light feather that you really are. Yeah, yeah. You know, some someone said, "If it's not light, it's not right." 
And I, I can be very serious, as you know. <laughs> but, but, but I believe I believe in being light, actually. And one one can be light even when talking about serious things. Yeah. I said it's that connection, Don, with you, you, the authenticity, uh, the essence of who you are. That you, you find that sort of essence, if you like, in your life. Yes, I think that maybe I feel that I haven't sold out. No, that sold out is an interesting phrase. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't paint myself as in any way uh, perfect. And I, in lots of ways, I wouldn't hold myself up as a model for anything. But I would say on the main, I haven't sold out. And what do I mean by selling out? I mean, taking on another view, taking on another behavior. This, is, this happens especially in the teenage years. When, when teenagers are trying to find their feet and they're insecure, which is natural. Yeah. And they're trying to find a way in the world. Yeah. And if, if, if a teenager overly adapts and goes in, uses alcohol as a social crutch, for example, yeah. or takes on the, a behavior that is not true to them, and they take on this behavior with great effort, in order to try to fit in, to be accepted, to be okay. And the problem is that, that that behavior can be continued for the rest of the natural life. Yeah. And when I say that I haven't sold out, I, I mean, I probably mean in that sense, that on the main, and I'm claiming no perfection here at all. Yeah. On the main, I have tried to stay true to who I was as best I could. Yeah. Even though that is not so easy at times. Yeah, yeah. And that comes all it goes all the way back to your story from, from day one, Donna, from your, your childhood, really, isn't it? Because you, you had that connection, you had that connection to nature from the very start. And you've you've been able to maintain that. Uh, and I guess that's the that's the challenge for a lot of people in the modern world. How do, how do they uh, how do they get back to that? Uh, they always had that uh, connection. They always had that connection, but uh, it can be very easy to lose it. I guess. Yeah? It's it's really a, a return to simplicity. Yeah. It's a return to raw nature. It's it's a shedding. It's a shedding of what we have acquired over the years. The complexities. It, it's it's. I have realized in fairly recent years that success, quote unquote, is not about acquiring, it's about shedding. Yeah. yeah. And to be who, to be more of who we are is to drop some of what we're not. Yeah. 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 Because we're perfect, essentially we're perfect. But we, we are under the delusion that somehow we are not okay. We're flawed in some way. Mm. And this is, a, this is the breeding ground for insecurity. Yeah. I'm a big fan of, of Dr. Shivali, who is, a, who is a, a parenting expert. Yeah. And she would say that that children should be valued, treasured, respected for being, that parents should value, treasure, etc., their children for being and for no other reason whatever. Mm. Mm. That a child, a child should not be seen as better because it's good academically or in sports. And when a child gets from its parents in particular that its value is based on its success yeah it's a breeding ground for insecurity for the rest of that natural life unless something is done about it unless there's some kind of waking up process yeah because yeah. 
say, say a child is gifted academically. And if they get the message from the parents, oh, you're great and you're, you're wonderful and we're proud of you, etc. But if the communication to the child is, is this, your genius and your intelligence and your accomplishments are, are what we like about you most. Yeah. Then the child hears that, oh, I'm valued, I'm okay as long as I'm successful. Yeah. I'm okay as long as I'm achieving. Yeah. I'm okay as long as I'm climbing the corporate ladder. Yeah. E equally with someone who's gifted in sport. Yeah. And what happens when that success falls away? Yeah. The person is lost. Yeah. yeah. They have nothing to fall back on. Their the rug has been pulled out from under them. Yeah. yeah. And anyway, anyway, real love is non-dependent on anything. Uh, there is no such thing. There is no such thing as conditional love. It's an oxymoron. Yeah. Love is unconditional, or is not love at all. Yeah. yeah. Can I can I can I quote Shakespeare? Of course, I don't. Know. <laughs> Shakespeare said, "Love is not love that alters when it alteration finds. Love is not love." that alters when it alteration finds. Mm. That says it beautifully. Mm. Brilliant, yeah, yeah. We, and yeah. We, cannot, we cannot love that which we're afraid of. And we cannot love that which we're criticized, that yeah. which we criticize. Yeah. yeah. You, love, love cannot go with fear and love cannot go with criticism, but we generally criticize because we're, we're afraid anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Criticism comes. Criticism comes from our own frustration. Yeah. So I guess this, 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 in the simplest form, there's two states: uh, one is love, and one is fear. And uh, it's your choice, really, isn't it? What's well, it? it's a choice once you see it as a choice. Yeah. But a choice, a choice is only real when it's seen. I mean, I, I have the option to book a. I have the option now to book a flight to New Zealand after we finish this call. Uh -huh. But unless unless it comes to my awareness as a possibility, it's not real. It's theoretically possible. Yeah. So so a choice is not really a choice until the choice is seen. Yeah. So as awakening awakening to that uh, unconditional love and. Uh, uh, Awakening to that uh, mindset, if you like, how, 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 do people, how do people awaken, if you like? Well, it's interesting that you mentioned mindset. I would, I would say that it's the, it's the absence of mind. Yeah. We, you know, we talk about mindfulness. I would suggest that it should be called heartfulness. Yeah. That mind is okay for making lists and calculations and making plans. Yeah. But there isn't much wisdom there. Yeah. Uh, basically, what I'm trying to say is that this is partially living from the neck down. Yeah. And it takes courage. Yeah. Uh, the competitive world tends to cause us to move up to the head because yeah. it's safer it's more judgmental, it keeps us separate. The head keeps us separate and the heart, the heart tends to unite us. And, mm. and we all know that when we're in the flow, yeah. we've all had occasions in our life when everything is flowing. We're at an occasion, a family occasion or whatever, and everything is beautiful, that there are no problems and, you're happy to move around and meet people and everything is great. It, that is generally when we're not up in our heads. We have lost that, that rigid sense of a separate self. Yeah. Clearly, we're, clearly we're separate physical entities. But essentially we're one. I mean, it's called a universe for a reason. 
Yeah. There's only one. Yeah. I mean, the source of all. Yeah. And any of us that thinks that we're self-made people are delusional. Yeah. Even even on the level, <clears throat> even on the level of planet Earth, we're all breathing the same air. Yeah. We're all heated by the same sun. Yeah. We are all transient, or fascinating, amazing, organic entities that appear on this planet for a while. Yeah. And then inevitably die off and physically go back into Mother Earth where we came from. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, Tom. So it just uh, we're nearly nearly needing to wrap up soon, but just one question: the the unknown as opposed to the known, Tom. Can you? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you wake up in the morning, you don't know what's going to happen to you today, do you? Uh, you don't. Not exactly. You may think you know, but you <laughs> you, you don't. You yeah. see, the life is so paradoxical. I once said. I once said that. Um, that whatever the world tells you, believe the opposite, yeah. and you'd be closer to the truth. Yeah, yeah. Most things in life are inverted. Yeah. In fact, real freedom is in the unknown. Yeah. Our life begins, life begins at the edge of the known. Yeah. And there is no freedom in the box of the known yeah it's a prison yeah and but we we go there in the mistaken belief that there is there is security yeah uh, but as i said everything is inverted and and whatever you think now consider the opposite it might be true yeah yeah that that it's in going into the unknown that is the courage and the willingness to go into the unknown you'll find freedom and in my own life in more recent years i have seen that one thing that is essential in making progress in this area is a willingness to be is a willingness to be comfortable with the uncomfortable be comfortable with your discomfort. To get something, you have to go through something. And you will not get anywhere by the path of least resistance. Yeah. You know, the, sw the, the salmon swims against the, the, the flow of the river. Yeah. And there are all kinds of examples in nature to tell us that we need to we need to swim against the current at times yeah while being utterly respectful and caring of ourselves at the same time yeah so so it's a it's a matter of being as comfortable as you can dare dare to be comfortable with the uncomfortable yeah 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 yeah, I love that all. It's, it's, it's incredible, incredible wisdom. And uh, I, I would say it's a real coming from your real experience of life. And you're, you're, you're constantly, I guess you're constantly meditating on, 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 on the way to live. And that, that's like, a, that's just a journey that you're on. And you've been on that journey from, from day one, really. Yeah? Yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter of reorientating oneself. Mm. Uh, away to some degree from the world and towards that which is the source that which one really is anyway yeah and in reality we cannot say what we are but we can say what we're not yeah we're not our careers we're not our possessions we're not our relationships we are not even our experiences, we are not our memories, we are not our bodies, we are not anything at all. If you can, if you can describe it, you're not it. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
So that that journey continues, Donald, for you because you're 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 on a lifelong journey, uh, and uh, I mean, love of life is uh, is I guess and, and uh, reflection on life and and uh, philosophizing on life. And it's, it's 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 a, it's a small but important shift away from overly focusing on making a living. Yeah. Towards really living. Yeah. But really, I don't mean really living in the sense of climbing Everest, although there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. I mean, what I mean by living is the courage, the willingness, the fortitude to be truly present to oneself yeah. without the need for any external stimuli of any kind. Whether you're on your own or whether you're with people is equally good whether you're outdoors or indoors. In other words, you're happy, peaceful, and content, regardless of circumstance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's incredible, Donald. I love that. Uh, that's, that's, that's just an incredible insights into, into a life well lived, if you like. And uh, uh, we're, we're gonna have to, uh, I, just, I just wanted, uh, we met first on the uh, Outstanding Network with Pat Slattery, a great friend of ourselves, both of us. And uh, we now have an opportunity to work together with the Your Holistic Academy project. And uh, uh, it's inspiring, inspiring to meet people like yourself, Donald, and to share this journey with people like yourself. Uh, so thank you so much for the conversation today. It's been absolutely incredible. And uh, looking, forward to, uh, looking forward to working with you in the future. Yeah, yeah thank you, John. Thank Thanks you, John. Okay. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much.